Welcome back. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about some of the troubles I've been having lately. Um, so I uploaded a few videos back that, that sort of describe some issues I had with um, these Tigo uh, rapid shutdown modules that I recently installed in my system. So if we take a, a couple steps back, I haven't really provided an update lately. So essentially I replaced my Victron system with um, a Schneider system. So it consists of Schneider XW Pro uh, inverter, uh, two charge controllers, the MPPT100, which is the high voltage inverter, and that starts operating around 192 volts, and then the MPPT60, which is a low voltage um, charge controller, and that has an absolute maximum of 150 volts, and it can operate as low as your a few volts higher than your than your uh, battery voltage. Uh, I also changed my batteries from Battleborns to the EG4 um, Life Power 4 batteries. So I've got five of those. So that's like 25 kilowatt hours of batteries, um, and those are plugged in open loop to the Schneider system. So I've got the XW Pro, the two charge controllers. Um, I've got the SCP, which is sort of um, a screen. Uh, an Insight Home, which is the gateway, so that's the thing that connects to the internet, um, and also provides a local um, web interface that's 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 only local to your home. And then recently, um, I added the uh, Disconnect RS, which is a product that's designed with uh, Tigo or Tigo. I also think it's uh, Tigo. Um, and Tigo makes these uh, rapid shutdown units, so it's a way to get essentially a 48 volt system code compliant. Um, so the three reasons I switched to Schneider um, really were for uh, code compliancy. So one is that the charge controllers have arc fault detection, and that arc fault detection is provided through the Disconnect RS, so that's a separate box again with the with the Tigo um, uh, compo <coughs> excuse me components inside it also has ground fault detection um, and that's essentially providing a little fuse that connects the um, the negative of your array to ground via um, fuse um, and it can detect whether or not you um, you know basically short your positive to ground um, and then it also, uh, with if you opt to buy the uh, Tigo rapid shutdown modules, which are required for uh, solar panels on your roof, then you need um, the Tigo optimizers, or excuse me, not optimizers, the, the Tigo uh, rapid shutdown units. And these are the TS4AFs. So these do a single uh, module at a time they're rated up to 90 volts and 15 amps and 500 watts. So it's essentially one panel. Uh, you can get them for two. <clears throat> but, um, so, sh long story short, the system was installed for a few months. Everything was good. Without the Tigos, everything worked well. Um, super happy with the EG4 batteries. <clears throat> uh, there's also a battery uh, monitor in there, a Schneider battery monitor. Um, and all of those components uh, speak to one another over a proprietary language called Zanbus, which is the Schneider uh, version of, you know, some type of Ethernet communication <coughs> between the modules. And um, that Ethernet provides um, power to some of the units, provide power to the other units, and it all works, and it's, it's fairly straightforward. So um, the... The main issue I've had is with the Tigo uh, rapid shutdown unit. So I installed um, uh, the first set, I think, on the low voltage array. So I've got two arrays. I've got high voltage array, which consists of 10 panels. So it operates somewhere around 300 volts. And then a low voltage array, which con consists of two strings. So they're two 120 volt strings. Um, so again, they're you know, three panels a piece. Um, and so I installed them on the uh, the low voltage 
uh, uh, string parallel combination. And it was cloudy and I didn't really, you know, pay attention too much and, you know, everything was, you know, working to some degree and, you know, and then um, maybe a week later I installed them on a high voltage array. And at that point the sun was shining and then I started noticing a major power hit. And, you know, between work and, and life I didn't really pay attention to what was going on until a few days later and realized, huh, you know, these are no longer tracking max power. Um, so, with the low voltage array, um, what I found was that instead of operating somewhere around 90 volts, um, which is sort of the uh, maximum power point of three, you know, three 40 volt panels is somewhere around 90 volts, it was operating somewhere around like 56 volts. And I said, that's interesting. Why? Um, and then um, for the high voltage array, it was behaving even more erratically. It was essentially um, uh, going to VOC, which was 380 volts when it was hot, um, sticking around max power for a few seconds, um, maybe longer, uh, and then dropping to 192 volts. And I said, why is it stopping at 192 volts? And then I read the specs and I think, oh, that's the lowest voltage that it can convert power. And then it would loop back again and just keep doing this over and over again. And, and in some of the videos that I, that I released um, uh, for Schneider to look at, um, they, it shows that behavior. And I can you know, include those in the links or maybe I'll uh, uh, add them in here just so you can see so you don't have to click a bunch of links. Um, so essentially, um, you know, a few weeks passed. I communicated with Schneider back and forth with their their help desk and essentially you know they blamed a lot of things they said um, you know did you hook these up right it's like well it's pretty simple you know it's uh, four MC4 connections so of course I had to go through a lot and make sure and double check everything and check it again and um, as you know they, they essentially said um, nothing is wrong and I said okay um, well there is something wrong um, you know, I'm getting like 50% power here on a sunny day uh, because it's going through this iterative loop, or it's sitting at, at low uh, low voltage for the for the low voltage array. Uh, and then I said, um, then they said, okay, contact uh, Tigo, Tigo. So I did, um, and their solution was okay. Uh, you know, basically cut the power to. Um, turn the disconnect off and cut the power to the array um, and you should measure 0 0.6 volts times the number of units you have so for the high voltage array it was 10 times 0 0.6 volts so it's 6 volts and so that is an indication that these are all hooked up they're getting power and they're operating as they should so when when there is no stay alive signal um, the way the way that this the these up these uh, rapid check units work is there's a coil, and then um, the coil goes through one of the leads, be positive or negative, of of the string or the parallel string combination, and it sends a stay alive signal about every second. Um, that's what they essentially they said. Um, so that stay alive signal goes to this unit, and after a certain amount of time. Um, a, you know, it's a number, you know, a few seconds. If this doesn't get that stay alive signal, uh, then this thing disconnects and shuts down to 0.6 volts. Um, so, um, so a way to diagnose whether or not these are connected right is to measure the voltage when um, there's basically no current flowing or it's, it's sitting in open circuit. Um, and so, um, you know, I went back to Schneider and they said, okay, Tigo basically said that their units are fine, so, you know, what do we do? And then they said, okay, we're going to send you a new MPPT-100. And at the time, um, the MPPT-60 was behaving. It seemed like it was tracking power throughout the day. Um, and I said, all right, just, you know, send me an MPPT-100. Um, I installed it and 
of course, one minute later, it's doing the exact same thing. Okay, so at this point, um, maybe not at this point, but sort of in the middle, um, I decided to look into um, what I could do with Modbus. Okay, so um, what what happened is, um, or excuse me, in, in in that time frame, what I started doing was basically just operating the arrays at a fixed voltage, and that's something that I'm not sure you can do with Victron, um, at least not with their standard settings. You might be able to do it with with CAN, um, but essentially you can operate the array at a fixed voltage. And for me, uh, operating the array, the large, the high voltage array at, at 300 volts, basically you know provided as much power, very very minimal power loss um, through the majority of the day. All right, so um, we'll start off with Insight Cloud. So this is the web-based um, dashboard. Uh, you can go in here and you know you can look at your PV production. Um, that's updated very slowly. These are in 10 minute intervals. Um, you can uh, do a number of things, but you know one of the things that's important is configuration. Okay, so you can click in here and go to settings for particular devices. Um, and then you can kind of make changes to whatever component that you're interested in. So for my um, inverter, for example, um, you know, here's some of the settings. So one of the things that I like to change quite a bit is, you know, I basically, I run, um, my car charger at night uh, and um, I basically need to make sure that I don't export to the grid and that um, you know I don't just dump my entire battery to the grid so you know what what you do is you go in and you have to adjust a few things so uh, let's see if I can find them so grid support here so here um, I need to set this percentage of the battery that it's going to drain to to something low um, and then uh, you know to, based on you know how much I'm going to dump it into my car and then I need to make sure that this value right here is set to zero and so you would change you know this value and this value um, and then um, go down here uh, and click save changes okay and that typically works, um, but, you know, it takes time to get to this page and to kind of dig through. And, you know, if you're kind of, you know, going to change anything else, then, um, you know, uh, it's a lot of clicking and uh, things like that. So here, um, for example, with the charge controller, this is where you can set max power point tracking on or off and then set it to um, a fixed voltage um, and you know this is this works well but it definitely doesn't work well on a phone uh, if you're trying to change things on the fly throughout the day um, then moving on um, there is an additional um, local intranet uh, based uh, program that essentially you go through this routine where you plug your your um, gateway in and uh, it basically spits out this Java program that's um, on a little HTML file and you click that HTML file and it brings you to this IP address um, and you uh, have to proceed because it's not uh, actually secure and so you go in here and you wait and you wait. And so while you're waiting, you know, I think the, the main issue here with the, the kind of the web-based version is, 
you know, you, you basically need to refresh some of the values because you can change a value locally on the hardware uh, and it doesn't update this web. And then you click interface. And then if you click refresh, some of the values will actually be wrong. Um, I, you know, I'd have to like dig through and find some that are wrong. Um, but it, it kind of is scary, you know, when you click save changes, are you saving just the changes? Are you saving everything? And I've, you know, I've, you know, in the prior months, I, I've saved things from here and then come back, you know, a few days later and realize like, oh, wow, something got actually, you know, something changed that I didn't mean to change. So um, I found that this insight local is much, much better because you're basically, you know, changing a few buttons at a time and, and no more. Um, so here, you know, you enter some type of password. And again, this, this interface is slow. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's through Wi-Fi. I think you can hardwire it, but um, then, you know, you have to be basically at the computer. Um, and so this is Insight Local. Um, so this is my system right now. It's nighttime. The inverter is on and drawing a little bit of power every now and then. Um, it's particularly slow tonight, but okay. So if we click the inverter, um, here you can, this is where you can see like actual live updates with, um, you know, things are changing kind of on the fly. Um, and so if you want to configure, you click configure. So again, if you kind of add up the amount of time that it takes to get to this point, that's what I'm trying to avoid. So go to advanced and then, you know, I would go to my, uh, my grid support settings. So here um, I have grid support enabled. Um, and again, I would change this value from like 98% during the day to 35%. So that means that now I'm going to, you know, drain my battery. Um, I'm not going to export any current. Um, and then you click apply down here. Um, and you know, if you, for example, wanted to charge your battery, you would have to go in here. Um, you need to set operating to standby, click apply, and then enable the charger and then click apply and then go back and go back to operating and click apply. And then come down here to charger settings um, and you know basically make sure that everything is okay here. And then in your battery settings, um, you need to decide whether you're gonna do state of charge control, which is, you know, are you going to base your charge? Are you going to charge up to a particular percentage? Um, or are you going to charge to a particular voltage? Um, and here you, you know, have to do some kind of tinkering and figuring out how um, and what are the appropriate values for your, uh, your boost and absorption voltage. Um, at the particular power level that you're charging. So for me, you know, I sort of charge quickly and then slow down as you hit absorption. And at that point, the EG4s are happy. So, you know, these are very tweaked for the EG4s. Um, the EG4s sort of charge up and then start cutting out. Um, and so they don't really follow the normal like uh, bulk and boost and uh, absorption phases. So they're a little different. I could make a video on that later. Um, so anyway, you know, you would save and, and then, uh, you know, go back to your dashboard and, and voila. Okay, so um, what I wanted to do was, again, make that um, a little bit cleaner. And so I dug into Python. Um, there's a few things that you, you know, you basically install Python. It's free. Uh, you can, um, you need a, a couple of extra modules. So this PY Modbus TCP. So this is a TCP um, based program or communication to the Schneider equipment. Um, I should show you on here. There is one thing that you do need to make sure and that's in setup and um, not in Modbus settings, but in the network settings, 
you need to go to Modbus TCP and you need to enable this Modbus TCP. And that basically gives you a warning. It says, eh, this is not uh, secure at all. It's an old protocol. Um, basically, you need to trust anyone that's on your network is not going to, you know, hack your system. Um, so once that's enabled, then you can do TCP uh, Modbus communication. Um, you know, making a GUI in uh, uh, Python has has is not very fun. So most of this code uh, is making the GUI. So there's some small snippets where you're kind of writing the register values um, based on the register uh, maps that Schneider provides. Um, and those, are, I believe, are located in the um, on the Gateway web page. So you can find a link and it has a zip file that has sort of the main components and the addresses. So essentially, you're just reading um, an address based on uh, a, let's go to a function that actually has something. Um, so here, for example, so I'm going to read the state of charge and the export amperage. So uh, the register is the address of the register. The unit ID is the, um, is the inverter ID. So each component has a different ID. The register count is the number of registers. So each variable has either one or two uh, registers that you're reading, depending on its value. Um, the IP address you plug in and the port uh, for the uh, particular value um, you have to provide. So it's IP address and port, um, and then there's a scaling factor. So this Modbus, TCP Modbus, uh, Python library um, provides this function, Modbus client, and then read holding uh, registers. Um, and then, um, so essentially you can provide, you know, these inputs to it, auto open, da 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 da, -da unit ID. So that opens your uh, Modbus uh, line of communication, and then you read the holding registers based on the register and the number of registers that you're trying to read. And then I pull it into a thing called clean function or clean registers, which then gets a, you know, this big binary uh, or hex number. It's not hex. It's, uh, it's a hex converted number. That's, that's, you know, base 10, I believe. Um, and then um, that could be wrong. So essentially it's, it's numbers that are go up to whatever this is, you know, 65,000. Um, and so you kind of do a little bit of math and then you can get kind of the first and second values of uh, the register. If it's a, if it's uh, two registers or not, um, here's the clean register function. Okay. This code I'll, I'll put online. Um, and um, again, uh, David in uh, was ACDC, um, AC to DC, Arizona, something like that. Um, he's, you know, basically wrote, I believe these functions, um, and to some, you know, I guess there was some stuff that I had to change a little bit. Uh, and then the rest of this though, um, is, uh, based on, um, making the GUI. So, there's a bunch of read and write functions. There's a way more efficient way to do this, but you know, write MPT auto that's turning the auto um, auto tracking on and off, um, plotting live power, getting live power. So this is the instance where I'm actually trying to plot live power, um, and then a lot of this is GUI stuff. Um, and get battery, get export, and then here's a lot more gooey stuff down here. Okay, so if you run this, um, it pulls up this gooey. Okay, so here, um, the main, you know, it's reading the state of charge of the battery right now, uh, 53 volts, there's no solar coming in, I'm not exporting anything, and there's no load. Um, and so this basically can, you know, there's a button here that sort of reads the current state, 
and that you can write a new value to it. Um, and um, the program is sort of split between left and right. So here you can enter your IP address, the port. Um, there are two different ports. One, majority of the registers are stored in 503. Some I believe the inverter has some values that are in 502, um, which are hard coded. And so this thing is just looping um, right now. So it's in a callback function that's just looping back and forth and reading sort of these uh, six values up here. Um, and, you know, if I click log, um, it may not work right now yet because I don't have this set up correctly. But essentially, there'll be a live plot here as a function of um, power as a function of time. And then on this side uh, is the um, IV curve. So it can generate IV curves um, by clicking this button right here. Uh, and um, it basically runs through an array of voltages for each of the curves. So I believe this will work. And it takes quite a bit of time. Okay, so right now the status is it's in the MPPT60 loop. So it's going through these functions here. Um, and again, we're gonna we're gonna get ugly IV curves. They're basically gonna be flat. Um, so it's waiting two seconds between each voltage. So this will take some time. And so one of the you know I, I like the idea of uh, just a Python um, program because uh, you know you can run it on a Raspberry Pi or you can run it just on a computer. Um, the main thing that I found was that um, every time you generate a plot and do it the way that I do, which is with a canvas, um, it adds about 10 megabytes to the memory. And even if you delete the, the program, <laughs> the canvas, it still stores it. So it's, it's a known memory leak. Um, there are fancier ways to get rid of that problem by doing like multi-threading and that's just sort of above my pay grade. Um, so here are the IV curves of the system right now. There's basically none. You know, these should look like IV curves, but they're, you know, the, the system is off. Um, and there's literally no voltage because of the, uh, the Tigos or the Tigo um, uh, units essentially shut it down to zero volts um, when the whole circuit is connected. Okay, so um, this is the, um, you know, because of the memory leak, I said, oh, you know, I'd like to kind of do it in LabVIEW because I, I know LabVIEW and um, uh, can do that. A lot of this GUI stuff is just way, way, way more efficient. So, um, uh I moved to LabVIEW, and um, and essentially this is the uh, main program now. So here, uh, this is a plot of the. Um, go ahead and run this. So if you go, if you don't have LabVIEW, then you can do. Um, this is made in LabVIEW Community. Um, so LabVIEW Community is uh, a free version of LabVIEW, um, and. Uh, and you know it can essentially let you do most of what you would ever need to do in terms of uh, LabVIEW programming at home. So here, um, it's the same thing. It's it's um, you know using LabVIEW to and Python at the same time. So um, essentially, I have a read counter, a write counter, and I'm also connected to my Sense Home Energy Monitoring Unit. And so I'm reading every minute. I just set it. Um, I'm writing every, oh, I don't know, uh, 600 seconds. And I'm reading the sense monitor every hour. OK, so it's going to loop through. Um, it's going to update various values, basically anything in, in dark gray here. And it reads. Uh, it does a little beep just to tell me that it worked. Um, and then you know, if I want to change my export state of charge here um, and my export amps, I just type something in new and or I type in a fixed voltage here. So let's say I'm going to change that to 300 and I just click right. And then it reads again and 
there it is. So it's updated the uh, voltage that the MPPT100 is going to operate at. And then finally, I have a little VMAX function um, that can open up a separate VI. Um, here again, it's got basic inputs that it needs, two little Python scripts, um, the function name, and the array that it's operating at right now. So it's going through the MPT60, and then right now it's going through the MPT80. So those 280, 290, you know, the, those five values. Um, this stuff down here is the read and write register commands, which I'll show here in a second. So it goes through, it finds max power, um, closes, and then puts in a new max power point um, if you want to enter it. Um, so at this point, um, zero was essentially an invalid uh, point, so I'll just change it back to 90 volts and to 300 volts. We'll write that, <clears throat> and now it's fixed. Okay, and so these two values basically you can turn MPPT enable on and off, and that basically just bypasses this uh, voltage value. Um, and then the other thing that I did was um, uh, add in. Um, a, uh, a way to adjust the export. So export to the grid is basically a fixed value. So um, what's, if we look at the graph here, uh, I was programming during the day, so um, or over the weekend. So this is a particular graph and it's like, uh, you know, there's some missing data points here. Um, but essentially this is the power from MPPT 60. This is the hundred and this is the combined power. And then in red is the load, so I basically haven't had a load. And then in blue is the export. So um, the battery was charging up all the way to 2 o'clock, 2.30. Um, and then at that point, um, it starts exporting to the grid. And, and if I click this export equals solar, um, then it adjusts the export amps to the input solar power. Um, and so as the solar is declining, and there's maybe some cloud coverage here, it's adjusting uh, as you go. Uh, instead of just what it normally does is it, it um, you know, basically exports and then turns off when you get to like 97% um, and then turns back on and then turns off. And so you, you get a lot of turning on and turning off of your inverter, which is fine, um, but you know, this is just a little prettier. Um, and easy to easy to program. One thing you'll see are these spikes. So um, <clears throat> I have not figured this out yet, but uh, essentially, randomly, the inverter likes to just dump full power into the grid for a few seconds. So um, earlier in the day, it happened before six o'clock, and uh, this was a real event. But you know, these two events are the inverter just sort of. Uh, running free even though the export amps are set to uh, you know a fixed value uh, it just blasts the grid and um, i've noticed that when i open the car door of the tesla that it 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 frequently does it so i don't know if this is some weird interference noise thing but yeah really the only way to make sure that you're never ever going to export is not by setting export amps to zero but is to turning um, the grid support function completely off. Um, I don't have that programmed in here, but I easily could. So, okay, how do we get these um, this data? So the, this is basically a large array of the things that I'm reading. So battery voltage, battery state of charge. Again, um, each one has a port, each one has a unit ID. So the battery monitor is 190, the inverter is 10, one of the charge controls is 30, the other one's 171. And then the register value and the number of registers to read and then the factor. Um, the thing that kind of I got caught up on is what IP address do you actually read and write to? This is the IP address of the thing that it spit out, uh, the Insight Home spit out. So it's not the local uh, IP address on the back of the Insight Home. It's the thing that you create that is your local internet intranet thing. 
Um, uh, LabVIEW only runs version 3.9, so I can't to use 3.10 yet. Um, uh, again, like these, these register maps are available. Um, they can, uh, you know, they're uh, pretty easy to decode. Um, you know, it's, it's easy enough to write a simple Python script that, that basically checks and makes sure that, you know, the reading is actually correct. If you're off, oh yeah. One thing is that, you know, in the, in the book, it'll say, uh, register 71. Um, but then if you read next to it, it gives a hex number that's actually 70 and you need to actually read register 70 instead of the uh, number, which is 71. So uh, that's there just to fool you. Um, but yeah, you get this going and then, you know, you basically can read all these values and then dump them into um, your various uh, points of interest. Now, writing again is a little sketchier because if you write something wrong, um, you could mess things up. So don't get it wrong. Um, so figure out your reads before you even attempt to write. Um, and again, all these have either one or two registers and this scaling factor that you have to include. And then, you know, the Python code makes sure that it, it's reading and writing the right value. If it's higher than 65,000, it, you know, converts it into a slightly different type of number. And then on the bottom here is um, the VMAX searching function. So essentially you read um, or you write a new voltage, read the new current and the voltage or read the new power coming out of the device and then move on and move on. So if you kind of look inside um, the LabVIEW program, it's a it's sort of a state machine, but I forget what the name of this particular layout template is, but essentially, you know, you have various buttons. Um, if something is true, um, you're writing a uh, command that goes up into this loop. So up here, if there's no error, then you go through these various states. So start essentially initializes some variables. Read, here is where it's um, reading the register arrays and whatnot. Um, and then, um, for example, inside read register array, um, you are using the built-in Python um, uh, um, icons or you know, basically functions, whatever they're called. Um, so you put in your version and convert it and then goes into open Python. And then this is where you give it your various registers in the right format. Um, and um, it spits out this value, which is an array of clearly the points of interest. So battery voltage, battery percentage. Uh, I, uh, I forget everything here, but um, you know, you have to kind of transpose sometimes um, arrays and whatever, but you know, it, it all works. Um, so read, write, this is going to read my sense monitor um, to read my home usage and whatever it's reading as my solar output, which often doesn't agree with the Schneider um, reading and writing VMAX. I can go more into this later, but I think I'll, I'll stop it for now and then um, upload this and just see kind of what you guys think. I think what I'm going to end up doing is putting this all on GitHub. Um, you know, I, I really was kind of, worried about that at first, but then I realized that there's actually a free version of LabVIEW available. Uh, again, it's called LabVIEW Community. And this is actually written in LabVIEW Community. So all of the functions that I used are, are available. There's no um, additional modules that I needed to, to make this work. And then you can actually, if you go to tools and uh, build, you can build an executable uh, from this VI. VI is the name of the program. And, you know, if you had a, um, a computer that you didn't want to install LabVIEW on, it's a big program, uh, you can just uh, do the executable. And then that executable should automatically make you download the runtime file that's required to make this thing run, um, which is also big, but not as big as, as the full program. Okay, so if you hit stop, it updates the log. 
which is in this folder here. Uh, and um, that's an old error. And that's about it. So for now, I guess, you know, the, the, the it, it works. I don't have any like automatic VMAX finding right now because that's easy to program where I can just basically set, you know, I'll make a new timer up here that says, you know, basically find VMAX every 10 minutes or something like that. Um, I don't really need it yet. It's not shaded yet. So I'll, you know, I'll maybe add that in before I upload it to GitHub, but, um, you know, I think overall, you know, working with Modbus is, is actually fairly straightforward once you learn it. Um, and of course, with the help of, uh, uh, Dave in Arizona, um, you know, essentially getting some of these initial functions written was a, a big deal because it really allowed me to make sure that my read and writes, you know, the, these three lines of code would have taken me a long time to actually uh, get right, um, as well as uh, this chunk of code, the formatting of the registers and, and sort of the inverse of that, which is the cleaning up of the registers. So, you know, taking it from some weird number to some number that is, um, you know, 98% or, or whatever, um, it's, it's uh, you know, weird uh, register math so, uh, but overall, yeah, it's, it's working and, um, it's a temporary solution, I guess, to this Tigo problem. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully everything, um, can get figured out with Schneider. So I didn't go over this, but the, the, the lab you program uses some, um, a different program that uses some smaller, um, uh, VIs, excuse me, Python uh, program. So it's it just has sort of the fundamentals: read, read one register, read multiple registers, clean registers, and then just a big list of of the registers that you're going to read. Write is even smaller. Um, just taking your values, taking your write value, multiplying it by a factor, uh, doing these three critical lines of code, and then of course formatting, and then um, you know, read VMAX is, is pretty similar, um, sort of redundant, but read some registers, clean registers, and then uh, read VMAX. So. All right.